As we begin this episode, I want to thank those who've subscribed to the Into His Image YouTube channel and they told others about it. You may have heard that I've started an adjunct series to this one on church history that's called Lessons from Church History. While I attempt to leave most personal bias and opinion out of this series, I do have thoughts. How could I not? In conversations with friends and supporters of Communio Sanctorum, they've asked my thoughts on some things that we've covered here. And then they've encouraged me to share them as, well, they found them helpful in developing their own opinions and thought that others would as well. So I started the Lessons series. Now the Lessons are in no real order. I've gone back to review earlier episodes to draw lessons from them, but I also do them from current episodes. I mention that as we start this one, because we're going to take a look at a period of church history that I think has much to say to something that's going on in many churches across the United States right now. I'm going to have more to say to that at the end of this episode. For the church in the West, the 14th century opened on what seemed a strong note. Early in 1300, Pope Boniface VIII proclaimed a year of jubilee. This was a new event on the church calendar. The Pope's decree announced a blanket pardon of all sins for all who would visit the churches of Saints Peter and Paul in Rome over the next 10 months. A large crowds poured into the city. Boniface VIII was interesting. <laughs> he had a flair for the pomp and circumstance of pretentious ceremony. He regularly appeared in public dressed in royal, even better, imperial robes, announcing, I am Caesar, I am Emperor. His papal crown had 48 rubies, 72 sapphires, 45 emeralds, and 66 large pearls. Now, he could afford to be generous with pardons. At the Church of St. Paul, pilgrims to Rome kept priests busy night and day collecting and counting the unending offerings. For Boniface, looking ahead, the year seemed bright. The Vatican had held unrivaled religious and political power for two centuries, and nothing on the horizon pretended change. The Pope had before him the sparkling example of Innocent III, who a hundred years before had dominated emperors and kings. Boniface assumed that he'd carried on in the same vein. But just three years later, Boniface died of shock at the greatest personal insult ever inflicted on a Pope. Even as the Jubilee celebrants were rejoicing, forces were at work to end the hegemony of medieval papal sovereignty. You don't have to study history long before you discover there are often major changes brewing beneath the surface long before people are aware of them. The 14th century was just such a time. The Roman popes continued on in a business-as-usual mode, while radical new ideas and forces were altering European politics. The idea of Christendom, that is, a Christian empire unifying Europe from the 6th through the 14th centuries, was rapidly deteriorating. So-called Christendom had been useful in creating a semblance of unity in the 7th and 8th centuries when the rigid tribalism of the past saw incessant war. But its importance faded in the 12th and 13th centuries when that unity began to fracture once more under the emerging power of avaricious royals. Pope Innocent III had indeed demonstrated that papal sovereignty was effective in rallying princes for a crusade or for defending the church against heretics. But the 14th and 15th centuries saw a marked decline in papal power and prestige as that of kings rose. Because we are used to thinking of the world politically as a collection of nation states, it's kind of difficult to get our heads around the idea that they are a rather recent phenomenon. For most of history, people lived regionally. Their lives and thoughts were circumscribed by the borders of their county, even their village. For centuries, Gauls and Goths defined themselves by their tribe. It never occurred to them to call themselves French or German. Such national labels didn't come into play until late, as Europe emerged from the Middle Ages into what we call the modern world. A world, by the way, marked as modern <laughs> precisely because of this new way of identifying ourselves. By the 14th century, people were just beginning to get used to the idea that they were English or French. This was possible because for the first time, they began to think of the political state in terms that were independent of their religious affiliation. Europe was moving ever so slowly away from its feudal past. Land was less important as hard cash became the new emphasis. 
those at the political top came to realize that they needed ever larger sources of revenue, which meant taxes. Edward I of England and Philip IV of France, also known as Philip the Fair, were, as was typical for centuries, at odds with each other. To finance their increasingly expensive campaigns of territorial expansion, they decided to tax the clergy. But popes had long maintained that the church was exempt from such taxation, most especially if the money raised was going to be used to, well, let some other guy's blood out of his body at high speed. In 1296, Pope Boniface VIII issued a decree threatening excommunication for any ruler who taxed the clergy, oh, and any clergy who paid without the Pope's consent. But Edward and Philip were of a new kind of monarch advancing to Europe's many thrones. They were unimpressed by Rome's threats. Edward warned that if the church didn't pay, the crown's protection of the church would be removed and their properties seized in lieu of taxes. Philip's answer was to block the export of gold, silver, and jewels from France, depriving Rome of a major source of revenue from its collections there. Pope Boniface backed down, protesting that he'd been well, misunderstood. He certainly had not meant to cut off contributions for the defense of the realm in, terms of, in times of need. It was a clear victory for both kings. Their victory over papal power had a ways yet to go, though. Reinforced by the success of the Year of Jubilee, Pope Boniface assumed that the reverence shown him in every corner of Europe extended to the civil sphere as well. He had another gold ornament added to his crown, signifying his temporal power. Then he went after Francis King Philip, trying to undermine his right to rule. Philip responded by challenging the Pope to show where Jesus gave the church temporal authority. In 1301, Philip imprisoned a French bishop on charges of treason. Boniface ordered his release and rescinded his earlier concession on taxation on church lands. The next year, Philip summoned the French nobility, the clergy, and other leaders and formed a kind of, well, early French parliament. He then gained their unanimous support in his quarrel with the Pope. And one of the new civil ministers put the choice that they had to make this way, quote, my master's sword is made of steel, the Pope's is made of words, unquote. Several months later, Boniface issued the most extreme assertion of papal power in church history. A papal bull known as the Unum Sanctum, the Holy One, most famous of all the bulls issued in the Middle Ages. This one asserted the Pope's authority over all other authorities. Now, his meaning was unmistakable. He declared, quote, it's altogether necessary for every human being to be subject to the Roman pontiff, unquote. Now, Philip's counter to the unum sanctum was no less drastic. He moved to have Boniface deposed on the grounds that his election had been illegal. And to carry out his plan, Philip turned to William of Nogare, the lawyer helping him set up the political foundations of France. Now, Nogare was a master at producing so-called evidence He'd gained testimony to support his case by such dubious means as stripping a witness, smearing him with honey, and then hanging him near a beehive. His case against Boniface went way beyond the charge that his election was illegitimate. Nogare claimed that the Pope was guilty of heresy, simony, and gross immorality. Now, given authority by a French assembly of clergy and the nobles, he rushed to Italy to bring the Pope to France for trial before a church council. Boniface was 86 and had left Rome for the summer. He was staying in his hometown when Nogare arrived with troops. They broke into Boniface's bedroom, violently manhandling him. They waited a few days for him to recover and then prepared to return to France. But the people of the town discovered what was going on and rescued the Pope. He died just a few weeks later, thoroughly humiliated. This tragic affair, it kind of becomes a marker a turning point in how popes and princes related to one another. Europe's rulers would no longer tolerate papal interference in what they regarded as political matters. The problem was, after so many centuries of Christendom, it was difficult sorting out where politics ended and church affairs began. What was clear was that a king's power within his own country was now a fact. At the same time, abuse of a pope, even an unpopular one, was deeply resented by the common people. 
despite his declaration of the Jubilee, Boniface was not a beloved leader. He'd been a target of much criticism. To give you an idea of just how low Boniface's esteem had fallen, Dante, the author of the Inferno, reserved a special place in hell for him. Literally, the eighth circle of hell is where Boniface is found, just one ring above the lowest circle. Still, the Pope was regarded as the Vicar of Christ. Few people at that time could even conceive of Christianity without the Pope and the religious hierarchy that he presided over even when there was no political vocabulary for it. People of the early 14th century began to distinguish between secular and religious authority, and they recognized the rights of each in their own place. When Boniface's successor died just after a brief reign, Philip's daring coup bore its inevitable fruit. In 1305, the College of Cardinals elected a Frenchman, the Archbishop of Bordeaux, as Pope Clement V. Now listen, Clement never set foot in Rome, preferring to stay closer to home where he was always accessible to do the royal bidding. Clement's election marked the start of a 72-year-long period called the Babylonian Captivity of the Papacy, named after the Jewish exile some 2,000 years before. Following Clement, six popes, all of them French, ruled from the French town of Avignon rather than Rome. Now, this relocation of the popes to France it was more than a matter of geography. In the thinking of Europeans, the eternal city of Rome stood not only for the idea of the apostolic succession of the church founded by St. Peter, but also of Roman imperium. Avignon was surrounded by what? Oh, you know, yeah, that's right, the French kingdom. Now, it seemed to the rest of Europe that the church had become a mere tool in the hands of the French king. This was resented bitterly in places like Germany. In 1324, Emperor Louis the Bavarian moved against the French Pope John uh, XXII by calling for a general council on the lines of the great church councils of the past that had been called for dealing with just such crises. Among the scholars supporting this call for a council was Marsilius of Padua, who'd fled the University of Paris. In 1326, Marsilius and his colleague John of John Dune uh, presented Emperor, Emperor Lewis with a work titled Defender of the Peace. Now, this questioned the entire papal structure of the church and called for a democratic government. Defender of the Peace asserted that the church was the community of all believers and that the priesthood was not superior to the laity. Neither bishops, popes, nor priests had any special function. They served only as agents of the community of believers. In this revolutionary view of the church, the Pope was made over into an executive office of the church council, which were simply spiritual elders. The Pope was subordinated to the authority of this council. This new church government form was called conciliarism, and it would soon move from theory to practice. But that, once again, is the subject for a later episode. Now, as I mentioned at the outset of this one, what we've looked at here speaks with special relevance to something that's happening in not a few churches across the United States right now. It's a highly polarizing movement called Christian nationalism. So let's see what light the developments in the European church of the 14th century can shed on the American church of the 21st. We're going to do that in episode 13 of Lessons from Church History. Thank you.